Hi everyone, this video is part two of the 2A series on perception and thought processes in the Unit 2 Cognition series for AP Psychology students. So let's start this video with a little bit of context. As you learned in the previous video, I have separated Unit 2 into two parts, and this particular lesson falls within the first section, which I'm calling 2A. And as you can see on the unit outline, we're still in the first topic titled Perception. In the previous video, you learned about general principles of perception, things like top-down, and bottom-up processing methods for interpreting sensory information. From that foundational understanding, the College Board is now con most concerned with you learning about one type of sensory processing, and that is visual sensory processing. Throughout today's video, I will cover a few major themes that are related to visual perception, and they follow these three questions. By the end of the video, you should be equipped with the knowledge and understanding to be able to answer each one of them. Throughout the video, I will explain the following key concepts. By the end, you should be able to define and describe each one of them. So now let's dive deeper into how the brain processes the visual information that comes in from the eyes. Let's focus here on depth. Have you ever wondered how your brain is able to determine how far away objects are without actually going up and touching them or measuring them? The answer is probably not because your brain does it so quickly. You've probably never really even contemplated how your brain does this. And this is a question of depth. So our brain is taking in all kinds of visual information from our eyes, and it's relying on a variety of visual cues in our environment to determine just how far away objects are. Two different types of cues the brain uses are called monocular cues and binocular cues. Let's start with binocular cues, specifically two kinds of binocular cues, retinal disparity and convergence. Let's consider the image on the right side of the screen. Imagine you are looking at a man in the distance with a tree directly behind him. The visual information your brain receives is slightly different than what you might expect. Each eye captures a slightly different image. The left eye sees the man slightly to the right of the tree where the right eye sees the man slightly to the left of the tree. These two slightly offset images are combined by the brain to create a single, more accurate representation of the scene, allowing the brain to interpret the exact location of the person. Our eyes are about six to seven centimeters apart, which gives them slightly different views on the same object, and the difference between these images is called retinal disparity. And this is a key factor in how the brain calculates depth. Retinal disparity refers to the slight difference in the images projected on each retina due to the eyes being spaced apart. This disparity is greatest for objects that are closer to you. And then that disparity becomes smaller as the objects move farther away. The brain combines these slightly different images to perceive depth, making it a critical binocular cue. Another important binocular cue is called convergence, and this refers to the inward movement of the eyes when focusing on an object that is close. Your eyes have to rotate inward or converge to focus on it. The closer the object, the more your eyes need to turn inward. The brain uses the amount of convergence or the angle between the eyes as a cue to determine the distance of the object. The greater the convergence, the closer the object is perceived to be. To see how your brain merges two distinct images into one, you can actually try the finger sausage demo. And you can see that on the screen. You can see there's a man participating in this demonstration and I'll explain it to you. You'll focus on a point in the distance and with both eyes open, hold two fingers pointed at each other about you know six to 12 inches away from your face and you'll slowly start to bring your fingers closer together without touching and try to continue staring at that fixed point in the distance rather than shifting your eyes to your fingertips eventually you'll notice the images that your eyes are taking in will overlap and you will see a floating finger where your two retinal images are merging um, you can see how those images change by bringing your fingers farther away from your face or closer together. Now you might be thinking, if I use binocular cues with two eyes to determine depth, how is it that I'm able to tell that objects are farther away or closer up, even if I have just one eye open? Well, the answer is that the brain uses all kinds of cues 
binocular and monocular cues together. They allow the brain to make sense of information in the environment and determine where objects are located. If you were to break down the word monocular, you would have the prefix mono, which means one, and the suffix ocular, which refers to eye or the ability to see. So even without any background knowledge, knowing those two parts of the word could help you break down its meaning. Monocular cues are visual details in the environment that help us determine the depth of objects. And it helps us detect this depth by using just one eye. Therefore, with these monocular cues, two eyes are not necessary for the brain to determine distance of objects in visual fields. The College Board wants students to be able to identify five monocular cues, relative size, relative clarity, texture gradient, linear perspective, and interposition. Now let's use the iconic photograph of Abbey Road and the Beatles crossing the crosswalk as our example. So let's look at the photograph and define and identify some of these key characteristics that we use as monocular cues in depth perception. The first is relative size. This cue helps us perceive depth by showing objects closer to us, appearing larger, even if they are the same size as objects farther away. In the Abbey photograph, Notice that the cars lining the street, they're all the same size in reality, but the cars closer appear larger than those farther away, and this provides us with a sense of depth that's called relative size. Relative clarity is a cue that relies on the difference in sharpness between objects at varying distances. Closer objects appear sharper and more detailed, while those farther away look hazier and more blurry. In the photograph, you can clearly see Paul McCartney walking barefoot. You can even see the wrinkles in his suit. However, as you look farther back, things become less detailed. Notice the white Volkswagen. You can see it has a license plate, but you might not be able to make out the license plate number. And as you look at the cars farther and farther in the distance, they become less and less clear. This decrease in clarity indicates distance. And this monocular cue is called relative clarity. Texture gradient is a cue that shows gradual change in surface check texture as you recede into the distance. At the bottom of the photograph, notice the pavement. It appears coarse and detailed, and you can see the visible particles in the pavement. You can see the dark and light textures. And as you look farther down the road, the texture becomes smoother and less distinct. This helps us perceive depth as well, and this is called texture gradient. Linear perspective is a cue that involves parallel lines, that as they go farther into the distance, they have the appearance as if they were to converge. And you can see this in the photograph where you notice the sidewalks meeting the road. Follow those lines off into the distance and you'll notice those parallel lines appear as if they are going to converge in the distance. The closer the lines are to us, they appear to be farther apart, but as those lines get farther into the distance, they appear to get closer together. And this depth cue is called linear perspective. Finally, we have interposition, and interposition is a depth cue that indicates distance as images overlap one another. The object that is partially covered is perceived as being farther away. In the photograph, George Harrison's face slightly overlaps the white Volkswagen, indicating that he's closer to the viewer than the car. This is interposition. These are the five monocular cues that you need to know for the AP Psychology exam. While there are others like light and shadow or relative height, these are the five that you need to know for the AP Psychology exam. Now that you understand binocular and monocular cues, it's important to understand that binocular cues are only useful in three-dimensional or real-world settings, where monocular cues can be used in real-world settings or when interpreting 2D images like photographs and in art. So far, I've touched on how our brains interpret the distance of objects in our view without moving or measuring, but rather relying on depth cues. Now, let's explore how our brains maintain accurate perceptions even when the visual stimuli change. Objects in our view may change shape, color, size, or even brightness, and our brains will not be fooled into thinking they've become something different. Our brain uses a fast, 
top-down processing method called perceptual constancy. For example, suppose you're sitting in class listening to a lecture and your instructor walks around the classroom and you notice that she begins walking in your direction. You might perk up and you might act a little bit more alert, but I imagine you wouldn't become alarmed by her growing shape and size. Even though the visual image of the teacher on your retina is in fact growing larger and larger, your brain knows to interpret this as your teacher walking closer rather than becoming larger. And you know this because it's not probable. Your brain understands the world and so you do not perceive her as growing larger even though in your visual input she is growing larger. And this is an example of perceptual constancy of size. Objects in your environment will not only change size depending on their distance, but they'll also change shape depending on their angle. Take a look at the image at the bottom right hand side of the screen and notice how the door as it opens, the visual angles and lines begin to change and the rectangle will begin to transform into what appears to be a trapezoid. But because your brain knows what doors are like and you have seen how doors work, you are not fooled by the shifting angles and you are are still able to interpret the door's shape as a rectangle regardless of the changing visual input. Perceptual constancies like shape and size constancy help us understand that our brains are able to construct stable perceptions even when sensory information changes. Objects may also change color or brightness, but because of perceptual constancy, your brain will continue to interpret the object as the color it believes it to be. This may sound a bit wild, but remember what we know about color and color vision. Light waves are detected by the eye in the photoreceptors that you know are rods and cones pick up that information and transduce it into neural messages that are sent to the brain. And we know that cones detect color and they need light, bright light to operate, whereas rods can operate in lower light settings but are unable to detect color. So let's take that knowledge with us as we understand perceptual constancy. Imagine you see a red apple in bright sunlight and then move into a dimly lit room. Even though the lighting changes, the apple will still appear red to you, even though your cones will not be able to detect it. This is because your brain maintains the perception of the apple's color as red, despite the different lighting conditions, due to color constancy. Here's another example. Suppose you're holding a white sheet of paper under bright sunlight, and then, a shadow of the tree casts over your white paper. Despite the change in lighting, the paper will still seem white to you and not necessarily gray. This is because your brain adjusts for the change in light levels, maintaining the perception that the paper is still white. And this is thanks to brightness constancy. So now let's talk about apparent motion. Apparent motion is a fascinating perceptual concept where we perceive movement in a series of still images or in stationary objects due to the way our brain processes visual information. This illusion of motion occurs when our brain interprets a sequence of static images as continuous movement, even though the images themselves do not move. Apparent motion is used in a variety of aspects in our daily life, from animation and movies to signs and advertisements, and this helps create the illusion of movement when there is none. I will share three examples. The first is the stroboscopic motion effect. And the stroboscopic motion effect occurs when a series of still images or lights are flashed at a rapid rate, making it seem as if the images are moving continuously. In the late 19th century, Edward Muybridge, a pioneer in photography, was interested in studying how horses move and he wanted to capture the movement of a horse in a way that could show each phase of the stride clearly. Moybridge set up a series of cameras along the track where a horse would run. Each camera was triggered in a sequence as the horse passed by, taking a series of photographs of the horse in different positions during its gallop. When these photographs are shown in rapid succession, they create an illusion of smooth, continuous motion, and this is an early example of the stroboscopic motion effect. 
Another example of apparent motion is the phi phenomenon. The phi phenomenon occurs when stationary lights blink on and off in succession, causing us to perceive continuous movement. You can see this demonstrated in the flashing blue dots on the screen. You can also find the phi phenomenon in many places. You might see it on the loading screen on your device or in lights on a scrolling LED sign, or even in a holiday light show. When the lights blink in a specific sequence, we perceive a fluid smooth movement of light across the display, even though it's actually just single blinking lights. And finally, the last example of apparent motion is the autokinetic effect. The autokinetic effect is the illusion of movement that occurs when a stationary light in a dark environment seems to move on its own. This effect happens because in the absence of a stable reference point, our eyes and brains start to perceive slight movements as significant. As you sit in a dark room with a single small light, such as a dim LED, and you stare at it for a while, the light might actually appear to move or dance around. And this just happens because Without a frame of reference, the eye muscles, tiny and involuntary movements lead to the perception that the stationary light is moving. So to close out today's video, let's do a short review. I will read the questions aloud, but not the answers. So be sure to pause the video if you need a little extra time to process the response options. I'll share the correct answers at the end of the video. Question number one says, Narmeen is viewing the board in the classroom. She knows that the board is located far away because the view from her left eye is only slightly different than the view from her right eye. Her ability to judge the distance of the board is due to which depth cue? Question number two says, even though the banana seemed to change color as the lighting of the room changed, Jane knew that the color of the banana was not actually changing. This perception is due to... Question number three says, Amber experienced the illusion of movement when looking at three stationary adjacent blinking lights. This effect is called... This concludes today's video on visual perception. 